Hi friends, I'm Linda Pritchard and I just finished a video how to quill a knife sheath. I wanted to introduce you to some um, helpful books that got me started doing native quill work. A Quill Worker's Companion by Jean Heinbach. This is the book that I actually learned from and I found it was very helpful. Also, um, one of the other really great books is The Techniques of Porcupine Quill Decorations Among the Indians of North America. This is by William Orchard, also a really good book to get you started. Um, this Guide to Indian Quill works pretty good too by Christy Ann Hensler. And uh, all these books are really nice books to get you started uh, learning the correct stitches especially for beginners, but even for even for advanced quill workers, it'll show you some really, really good um, advanced stitches. So I wanted to show you a few things that you're going to need to get started so you can kind of get um, all the essentials together to actually build a, um, a native knife sheath and then quill it. First of all, first and foremost, you're going to need some very good grain tan. You're going to, it's got to be a very high quality grain tan that's soft and pliable. You're going to need that foremost. Uh, you, you can always um, search the internet if you don't know anybody that uh, does brain tan or learn to do it yourself. But it has to be very soft, velvet-like brain tan. The next thing, after you have your brain tan, I like to use a graft paper to draw my pattern out on. And I explain a lot of this in the video that you'll be able to follow along with. You're going to need a lot of good measuring devices to draw out your pattern and work with your actual uh, quilt sheath. Make sure everything is measured out precisely. I like to use a water soluble pen to mark my design out on the rain tan. A pair of good scissors, a pair of small scissors to cut your quill tips with. You're going to have to have a, a little bit of beeswax to actually beeswax your thread with. Uh, some good thread, either um, I like to use a Coates and Clark like upholstery thread. Some people use they'll use um, cotton thread. Um, some people even use a split sinew, but you know that that's your choice on what you want to uh, use and how traditional you want to uh, you want to do your quill work. Uh, I like to have some heavy linen cord. I use this on the edging. You'll find it very helpful also, um, and also for attaching your neck straps. Let's see, sharps needles. That's what I use for quill work, and most quill works corkers do use. Um, pliers. That's pretty much everything you're going to need to do quill work except of course your quills. And if you're not lucky enough to live in one of the states where you can get your own roadkill porcupine, um, you'll probably need to order them. Uh, I order them through Claw, Antler, and Hide Company. Uh, they have a website, www clawantlerhide.com and uh, for around $25 they do charge $15 in shipping if it hasn't changed any you'll get a complete dried porcupine that you can the way I do it I cut strips out of it then soak those strips in water and then you can easily pull them free from the hide sort them into the um, different sizes and, and dye them so those are all the things you're going to need to get started in doing a native knife sheath or any type of quill work for that matter and um, if you watch the video that follows we'll go step by step on how to do that thank you hi again friends I thought it would be a really good project to actually build a knife sheath a quilled knife sheath from beginning to end and show you each step that I do in um, achieving that. So um, this particular design is um, copied from an original sheath, uh, mid-1700s Great Lakes area. And um, they're pretty simple. The colors are pretty simple. Uh, 
red, black, and white usually. Um, even though they used orange a lot, yellows a lot, that sort of thing. And um, while they probably used a birch bark lining, um, we still like to use just a more simple, um, just a um, leather lining. My husband does those for me, um, made from rawhide. And um, maybe in another video we'll get him to show you how he does those. But he gets the rawhide and he soaks it in water till it's soft and pliable. And then first makes a pattern for a knife. And um, then I believe he does a saddle stitch with a linen thread for that. But you need to start off with that. You'll have the knife that you're going to use. And um, make your pattern. Usually with cardboard he makes a pattern. And um, then he goes ahead and does the knife sheath for me. I've, I have done the outer sheath first, but it, before, but it seems like it's a lot better if we have an inner sheath um, to start with. Okay, after you have that, you'll go ahead and you'll you'll uh, you can go ahead and use this as an actual pattern and um, trace around that. I like to use graft paper. That way, you can make sure. Um, everything is centered and you can put your colors on there see that you like everything before you actually start cutting it out on your brain tan now we have smoke brain tan which is a nice color um, but a lot of the a lot of the native items after the brain tan was tanned and smoked, then they dyed it, and they dyed it with walnuts to achieve a um, a black hide. Um, many of the originals that we still um, have in museums and such are on black hide, and um, this is a mixture of walnut and iron and. Um, before I've, I have added wild grape and um, sumac, but uh, you want to get a really strong, strong dye, and then I, you can soak it in it uh, to get it really, really dark, or you can just dip it in there to get it somewhat dark. Because um, even though this, I want this to be black, and it's not real black. After I'm done, I'll do the traditional greasing of the knife sheath, which will then darken it further and make it, it black. So the first thing we do, like I said, is we get our pattern. And we draw out, draw the pattern out. Now, what you can do is, you can take this pattern, and I will actually cut it out. Cut it out with scissors, lay it on my brain tan, trace around it, and um, we'll go from there in just a few minutes. Okay, you'll want to look over your piece of brain tan and decide where you want to um, trace your pattern out to cut it. I like to save um, a little bit of the of the thicker portion for the back and the top, the top part of the back. So um, I've decided that uh, this would be a good place to to trace this, this front. And um, I really like these um, water erasable pens. And I use them a lot and then you can just dampen the hide and it fades right out. Um, and if you're doing an intricate design, you can do it first in the, uh, the water erasable pens. And then once you get your pattern like you want it, if it's very intricate, you can go over it with a good ink pen. So as it gets wet, you won't lose your pattern. Um, you see you have the top portion of your knife sheath here. Well, this portion actually folds down so you can quill it. So what I have done is I will make that that much taller and um, 
leave myself plenty to fold over for the top flap of the quill knife sheath. Um, this is actually showing the back of it, but I just kind of faked that in so I can use it for a pattern to make it tall enough for the knife sheath. So I'll go ahead and start here and I'll trace around my pattern. Now, um, there's been times where I have um, actually finished out my pattern um, and, and quilled it from there, but I kind of like to leave a little bit of leeway in case we have any pooling of the quill work or anything um, that I can kind of go back and um, allow for it. But either way, um, you can go ahead and cut it out. A lot of people do it from a finished piece. And a lot of people don't. Um, now, at this, at this time, what I'd like to do is take my pattern. And I like to punch holes where I feel that um, I really need to mark it. And I will do that at all the points here. Like so. Then I will go back with my marking pen, lay it on my pattern, and mark through the holes, and um, then I can continue from there. Okay, once you have all your holes marked, go ahead and Run your pen through each of the holes so you can see when you pull your pattern up where you're going to draw in all your designs. And you'll, you can tell they're just some slight, small little dots. And um, these will be where you'll take your ru rulers. And um, I'll make my stripes down the center. And then I'll make all my little curves. And you want to take time to really do it precisely because this is real important on how it's going to turn out when you're done. Okay, um, I went ahead and um, glued the backing, the linen back, and um, I noticed when I was cutting that out, I had, I had not drawn all my different uh, pattern pieces and it was short. So once again, that I had allowed a little on the top which was good because by the time I allowed this top portion and folded it over, it'll be just just about the right length if everything goes right for the knife sheath. Um, after I glued on the linen back, of course I trimmed off the excess um, just to make it a little little easier to work with, so you're not, you know, having to um, handle too much material. So we go ahead and we trimmed off the excess. Gives you a nice firm piece to work with. Um, I like to allow that to dry. Oh, you don't have to let it dry too long, maybe, maybe an hour or so. And then the next step, um, we will start doing the zigzag quill work. Um, and I'll be showing you a couple different techniques um, to incorporate the black and white quills. And um, then after we do the center section, we will do some roping. The next step, um, before we actually start quilling, we'll need to um, do our quill selection. I 
keep buying in a large um, plastic container. Um, these happen to be uh, dyed with cochineal, and um, here's how I actually cochineal are bugs, and um, they're even used today um, in dyeing many of your foods. But um, these I actually got from uh, cochineildye.com, um, but you can get them many distributors um, from the internet but they're actually little bugs um, that are ground up I use an old blender with water and um, to actually make the dye and maybe at some point I'll actually show you how to make uh, how to make the red dye from cochineal bugs but um so um, you want to take time and actually select your quills that you're going to be using and um, soak them in water for about about a half an hour. And um, of course, quills come in all different sizes. But for this particular, um, you don't want these real fine ones. They would be more for line work. Um, something along this size is pretty good for zigzag. Um, something like this. Um, you want to be careful not to get extremely large like this one would be too large and um, something along this line would be just about right so you go ahead and um, I just soak mine in water and uh, for about a half an hour or so um, before we start the zigzag technique and um, you'll want to have some thread um, I like to use like a, a heavy button thread. You can use um, a cotton button thread or you can use nylon thread. You can use, um, if you want to be very, very traditional, um, linen or sinew. Um, I have never actually quilled with real sinew, but many people do. So you want to have your, of course, your thread. And um, you'll have to, um, before we start, we'll have to beeswax the thread. And um, a couple of uh, just regular sharps needles. And um, that will get us started. Okay, while the um, quills are soaking, we'll go ahead and, and um, choose a couple nice needles. Um, just an average size sharps needle will be fine. Um, I like to get about a yard of thread so I don't have to uh, stop and start a hundred times. And we'll go ahead and snip that. We'll go ahead and, and wax it, the thread. Keeps it from knotting up and tangling. Okay, you'll, like I said, you'll be using two needles. Go ahead and get those threaded. There's one. Um, I chose black thread for this project because um, since the gentleman wants, uh, wants this to look real dark afterwards, I thought it would blend in the best. If you're doing like an edging with white, you'll want to use white thread. So we go ahead and we get that nice and waxed. And we go ahead and thread it. Now I've noticed watching some videos and watching other quill workers, it seems like we all do it a little differently. So nothing is written in stone, it's just um, your preference. But I do a back stitch, and um, to get started, you will actually. Do a couple back stitches, and I see I've picked up a um, Glover's ne needle, so I don't want a Glover's needle. I'll go ahead and put that back and grab another one. Here we go. Oh, 
Alrighty, let's go ahead and make a couple back stitches right at the top right at the top. To lock in my thread. Okay, there's one side. Take your other needle. Same thing, right at the top, right on your pattern. Do a back stitch. And I've noticed when I work on a table, you can use it to actually push your um, needle down and save your fingers. Make sure we get that right to the top. Okay. Now, where some people I noticed, they leave their little tabs um, of thread each time and then little loops of thread and then insert the quill I don't like to do that what I do is see if I have a quill here ready to actually they need to soak just a few more minutes and then we'll actually show you how to start your quill okay the quills have soaked probably only about 15 minutes or so but they're they're starting to feel you want them you want them pliable and not brittle when uh, when you push on them um, and at this time what I do is I go ahead and um, I clip off the barb and I, I clip off the follicle end and a lot of people use all kinds of quill flatteners but I just run it between my fingernails seems to work the best for me and um, I have a real nice Jim Hayes quill flattener I like to use it mostly when I'm finished to um, to actually burnish my whole piece but here we go okay now we've got our flattened softened quill and we're going to lay it right underneath right underneath the thread and then I like to put my fingernail right down on where I want to actually sew and I pull the thread over top of it and right there's the line and I go in and I make a back stitch right up to the quill and I make sure that I go to the outside of the thread not to the inside and then I'll just just gently snug it down gently snug it down okay then we go to the other side and we fold it over make sure everything's nice and straight I like to put my fingernail right where I want it to be sewn do a nice little back stitch right up to the actual quill Like I said, I was watching a video this week of a friend of mine, and um, she um, leaves her little little loops and then runs runs her quill through. But I've I've never done it that way, so I don't know if I would be able to actually do it neatly that way. Okay, now once we've done that, we'll fold it back over. I think this is probably the best um, stitch to. Um, when you're learning to start out with. Okay, you want to keep everything nice and close, nice and straight. Once again, put your thread over it. Nice little back stitch, stay on your line. Go to the outside of the thread. Pull firmly, but not so much as to pucker the leather. Fold again. And don't worry if it's not, you know, perfectly perfect. Um, by the time you get your finished piece done, it kind of uh, all blends together and, and makes it look really nice. There again. 
go to the outside of the actual thread, not the inside. Pull up snug. Fold it right over. You want to take your time. Again, looks like we're going to be ready to start a new new quill. So we'll get ready to do that. Okay, now let's go ahead and um, need to probably trim a little a bit of this back so it doesn't hang over the other side. And we'll get another quill. Make sure it's soft, close to the same size as what you're working with. Trim off the barb and the follicle. This one might be a little small, but we'll see if it'll work. Go ahead and flatten it, however you choose to flatten it. Now to start a new quill, what you do is you raise this one up. Tuck it underneath. Nice and even. Snug it down. And continue on. And it's better to have a little more of the old quill under it than less, uh, or it'll tend to pop out. Okay. Now what You'll find if um, you learn to do the single line edging, that if your quills aren't perfectly perfect, that um, single line edging will frame it and uh, kind of make up for any little little mistakes or little uh, spaces. You kind of flatten that as you go. Go ahead and fold over again. You can see it's time consuming, but um, your finished product is worth it, worth the wait. We'll go ahead and continue on. And a lot of quill workers, um, I find with, if you're just working with one color, you can start them at either the top or the bottom. Um, but if you're working, um, in a pattern, you have to always remain with the um, one or the other, or you're gonna you're gonna mess up your pattern. Okay, here we go. We need an another quill and snip off the barb, and the follicle, flatten it out. Go ahead and insert it underneath this. I have to raise that up again a little bit. There we go. And once I start with the black and white pattern, um, wherever I start it, be at the top or the bottom, it'll have to remain that way throughout the um, throughout the rest of the um, piece. Or you'll see that your pattern will will not flow, it'll be the opposite of what you wanted. Okay, let's go ahead and see that. Getting a little bit of a knot in here, which happens to everybody. Take your time so you can pull it back out if you do get a knot. I want to adjust it in a little bit. Now this particular knife sheath, you can see that um, it's wider at the top than it is, the design is wider. So just stay with your, stay with your pattern and you'll be fine. And I found when I first started quilling, my 
It's kind of like if you, if you knit, you understand that um, if you pull too tight, that really gets you in trouble. You want to learn a nice, even flow. Um, where nothing is really, shouldn't be tight. Overly tight. Firm, but not overly tight. Looks like I might have to start another quill again. See, if you see, this this just isn't enough. You won't have enough there. So go ahead and choose another quill. It's practically the same size. You want to be careful where these... Um, Quill tips land too. Your animals and children won't like them in their feet and whatever. Or your husband. Or you. Okay. Let's go ahead. See that one needs snipped a little bit more because it's actually touching and showing on the other side. Okay. This is coming along fine. There we go. Now we're coming to my point where I'm going to start my um, black and white double quills. And um, black quills, they're dyed in, um, they seem to be the hardest, hardest color to achieve. And um, I managed to get a few black ones. Took me, I think, over a month to actually dye them every day and um, I got um, it was a very strong walnut dye iron grape wild grape and sumac and um, every day I would put them I leave the quills in there bring them up to a oh a high simmer for about, oh, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. Let them cool down and then steep in that. And I and I got a lot of brown ones and probably a handful of the um, of black ones. And I still, all my other quilt work friends seem like they have a hard time getting that black dye on their quills. And we see it on the native, the original pieces, but it seems to elude us in this modern world for us figuring this out. Okay, now right here I've got a end sticking out, so you want to take something nice and fine and, and push that back in. And like I say, even though there's some spaces there, by the time you put, you um, edge that in the, in the white all the way through, you won't be able to uh, be able to see it. So in the next point we'll start our, um, our black and white. Okay, today we're going to continue on with the two quill zigzag technique. Um, it's a simple yet striking quill technique, um, commonly found in uh, border work, and it also um, you'll see it in, in in many of the original pieces. So. Um, We'll go ahead and pick a, a black and a white quill that are close to the same size. And um, we'll go ahead and trim them. flatten them. Okay, now um, I want the white to show first, so let me go ahead and flatten this black one a little better. And I want the white to be at the top. So let's go ahead and sew that red down. Make 
sure your threads to the outside and um, we can go ahead and insert the black on the bottom give you a little more light here black on the bottom white on the top let's see it would be white on the bottom to show first as we fold it first white on the bottom black on the top this takes a little bit of uh, finger dexterity but you'll get on it tighten that down nice and tight okay we go ahead and um, make our first get that nice and flat make our first fold which is like I said that's going to show the white go ahead and hold that down on the line Stay right on your lines as you lock that one in. Go to the outside of the thread. Now you'll see this is going to start making a zigzag effect, but it'll go back and forth, black and white, black and white. Let's see. Now the black is showing. Fold that over again for the white to show. And as you've probably noticed, I'm left-handed. Um, so you may have to alter Hi, you hold things a little bit for right-handers, but um, this is the only way I know how to teach, because I am left-handed. Okay, get those nice and even, and we'll sew that down, and you can see we're going to need a white quill to fold over. Okay, let's find a white quill of the same width. And of course, these have been soaking in water again. Try to get it at the same width. Go ahead and insert that underneath. Looks like I could have trimmed that white one under their back just a hair or so to avoid it being so thick. Let's go ahead and see if I can slip under there without cutting my thread or a quill that I don't want to cut. Okay, let's go ahead and put this white one in. There we go. Fold that over. Trying to keep them as close as possible. Like I said, I like to keep my finger now pretty close to the line. We'll go ahead and continue through this one to see how we end up. Looks like this time I'm going to have to put a black one out. There's a little bit of that white quill showing. We'll tuck that under. There we go. And all right, here we go. Little technical difficulty there. So let's go ahead and. Attach this. Fold the white one over. Little porcupine hair on there. Let's see here. Alrighty, and we're going to be ready for a black quill this time. If you can keep from starting 
uh, your black and your two quills at, at once when you start adding them it, it just gives it a much nicer um, less bulky appearance okay trim this black quill flatten it however you want to flatten it Oop, that one squirted the insides out sometimes they'll do that and sometimes when they do that you can't get them to flatten but this one's going to be okay okay let's start this and um, while we're doing this there's a couple books that I don't know if they're still in print they probably are but um, I have uh, a Quill Work Companion by Jean Heinbuck, H-E-I-N-B-U-C-H. That's the book I learned to quill from. There's also the Techniques of Porcupine Quill Decoration Among the Indians of North America by William C. Orchard. That's also a good book. And um, it's amazing with a couple good books, you sit down and practice, you can get this figured out. But anyway, that's that's the books I learned from. Um, the native text site on uh, the web is also very helpful. Okay. Now, let's see. Stay on your line. I'm going to need a white one. Probably after I use, use a white quill will be might be all that I need to use for this this black and white strip. Get one, like I said, approximately the same size. Try to same um, width. Okay, we're going to insert it. As you can see, I've come to the end of my line, and um, I thought you might want to see how I, I finish off um, the quills. Now, I tend to want a longer quill than I've got here, but um, what you do is you just fold it in, tuck it in under, and tighten your string, tighten your thread, and then... Um, I like to go to the back of the material if it's not if it's not going to show. I don't know how other quill workers do it, but um, you could probably just do a couple back stitches and it would hold. But since that's on the bottom like that, I'm going to go ahead and go to the back. Um, on this piece, you'll never see it, and that way I can I can tighten it. Let's go ahead and make three tight knots. That seems to look nice and hold be holding nice. And I'll go ahead and do that with both sides. And um, then we'll get ready to um, start the line technique. And I'm going to change to a white thread because I'll be using white quills. And it will be a lot less noticeable. So we'll go ahead and tighten this nice and tight. Do it three times. Okay. Okay. There you have it. Um, and uh, we'll take a little break here. I'm going to soak some uh, finer, qu finer quills for the edging. Um, you want something pretty, pretty slim. Where these were used, something about that size is used for your line. Um, you want something probably about, I mean, for the zigzag, this is, you want something a little thinner for your line work.
Okay, I want to continue on um, drawing the single line work um, to frame in the zigzag. So um, let's start out um, drawing a couple back stitches to lock in our thread. Okay, now go ahead and make one more and we'll start. Okay, this time you do leave a little loop and you want to take one of the fine, finer quills than you would for zigzag. Um, go ahead and put it through the loop and pull it snug. Then you'll want to make a clockwise circle around both sides to get started. You, you won't after, this is the way I lock the first one in, probably isn't even necessary, but I do that. So then we'll <clears throat> make another back stitch, and then I like to come to the inside and let it let it go ahead and, and uh, make its little crimp, its little roll, which gives you that rope effect. And again, clockwise. Now after you get started, I only go around, I don't go around the, both ends of it. And this, see I'm coming to the inside. gives it a little rope effect. Again, clockwise under under the quill. You want to keep the spaces about the same as you come next down next to your um, zigzag. Go to the inside. Give it a little 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 tug. Again, clockwise. About the um, width of the quilt of the um, zigzag quill will give you a nice, even um, stitch. Once again, we're going to go down here till we actually start a new one, so I can show you how that's done. To the inside. I am using a really long thread. Um, I just hate to have to start a new one in the middle. About the width of that quill that's been flattened. Pick it up, go to the inside before you have your loop before you pull it. Clockwise stitch. Let me show you right here, it might be easier to the out, see to this side. You can see where I went to this side. Now let's go ahead and start a new quill. Again, a nice smaller quill. And what I do, not once you've got it started, go ahead and loosen your loop. And You can put the follicle end in, snug it down, and don't stitch that bottom end this time. Go over top of it and um, continue on. About the width of a, of a folded quill, the inside. side. Yes, this thread is extremely long. Clockwise. Stitch, even stitch. Okay. 
go to the through the loop to the outside pull it. and you can see where it's um making a little rope effect and go through here okay and then after you get so far down you can trim off your little barbed ends or um, and off the follicle end but um, we can go clear down here till we can start another and just a um, a single thread waxed as always always wax with, I use beeswax I would think that would be the only thing to use okay let's go ahead and um, get down so far start another oops And you want to start it uh, soon enough that you're not going to end up showing any of the black part. So let's go ahead and um, get another fairly fine quill, lift up that last stitch, insert the follicle end. We won't bother that, but we'll do a clockwise circle around both of the uh, both of the quills. Oops. And you'll do the, you'll go around both of them till you get to the dark part of the um, shortest quill, and then you can just drop back to the long quill. I'll show you what I mean here. Usually, two or three times, and you've got it locked in real well. And now I'll go ahead and leave this part. I won't stitch it anymore. Just go around the lo the new quill clockwise. Okay. Whoops, that happens too. It'll flip over, so be careful it doesn't do that. Um and um I'll continue on till I get around the whole um zigzag piece. And as you see, even if you have little spaces or a little bit of unevenness, it's such a nice little frame that it makes everything look nice. Okay, as you can see, I've went ahead and um, done all of my line work around. I trimmed off all the tips left a couple here so you can see I cut them pretty close. You'll have both the bar band and the follicle end to trim. And um, so now let's go ahead and use this end here where I finished and um, we'll see if we can't go ahead and uh, start doing little places that little points that stick out here. Um, I touched them up again because of being damp. You couldn't see them very well, so I went ahead and touched it up with my pen, my water-soluble pen. And like I said earlier, if it's, um, you know, that's going to show this dark. I'm going to back that up a little bit. If I didn't lock it, I didn't. Okay, good. Back that up a little bit till we get more into the white. Let's go one more time and I'll start another quill right there. Okay. 
and I'm just going to, after I came around that top, I'm just going to continue on with the, the trim. Little diamonds coming around the side. Okay. Okay, take my fine quill. And let's go ahead and insert this. Mm -hmm. Let's see where that is. Clear back there. Okay, that's fine. We don't want that dark portion of the quilt showing. And this is done exactly the same way as I did uh, the trim. Only you're following a, a straighter line. And when you get to the tip, you want to make sure you stop right here. And then start down, or it's going to look more rounded if you don't actually have a little stopping point right there. So let's go ahead and see if we can come on around the, the top here. Pick this up right here. And we'll go ahead and um, show you how we go to the tip and come back down. And then I will go ahead and finish this on both sides. And then the next step will be cutting the back out. Because after we cut the back out, we will uh, do a whip stitch over the um, inner sheath. And... Um, then I'm ready to actually do the um, quilled edging. Let's let's make this. I don't know if we have enough room. For, I think one will be enough. See, I'm coming right to the tip. Going underneath again. Okay, now to keep that nice and sharp. Let's go ahead and put my fingernail right there on the tip. Keep it from being a rounded. We want it sharper. Coming back down. At this point, we want to make sure that's nice and a sharp tip. There you go. I'm going to have to start another quill real soon. That. Make sure you get your nice little sharp corner. I think I'm going out of the camera light, but let's go ahead and um, get a nice small one. You want to kind of dry your quill off a little bit after you take it out of the water, just doesn't matter, but I, I don't like it to um, erase my lines too much. So, okay. We inserted that in. Clockwise. Little wrap. And then just like on the other quill work, when you get ahead a little bit, you come back and trim all the little barbs out so they don't really get in your way while you're um, quilling along. Oops. That went underneath the back. You don't want it to do that. Okay, now I'm going to just go around the one now after I do it twice. 
And what's nice about these um, early, the early native quill work, it wasn't perfect. I mean, they had, you know, they didn't have rulers and they didn't have all this intricate measuring devices. So they don't have to be perfect. I think I'll go one more and then we're going to do a real sharp point. So come in as close as you can here. Close as you can. Or you'll have a big space. Alright. Let me get this one out of my way. Okay, let's see if we can't go ahead and get this one to lay in there. Go ahead and do a... Another back stitch. That one's going to lay pretty good. I'm about ready to start another quill again. Like I said, a little back stitch. Probably an eighth of an inch. Eighth of an inch out. Come underneath the thread. Pull it firmly. Let's go ahead and trim this up a little bit and see what it looks like. And then you can see with this water soluble ink, you can see how this will disappear. Okay. Now I'm going to continue on, and um, when I get this all done, um, the next video will show cutting the back out and assembling that. Okay, the next step is um, I'm going to go ahead and um, use the actual um, the actual sheath that the customer gave me to cut the back out. Um, it looks to me like I might make it a little bit taller than what he had in his sheath. So I'll move it down here a little bit. And um, you could also do it on, um, usually I, I just use a graft paper and um, make my own. But today I'm going to use his, um, my water soluble pen again. I'll trace around it. And then like I said I might make it a little taller. Let's go ahead and but this has a really nice shape. So I think I'll just come up a little bit more. And I drew it on um this part of the hide is, is heavy, so I like that um, a lot to give it some stiffness on the back. I'll probably just finish that out at the end. I won't do that right now. Okay, so I have the basic quill work done on the front. I'm going to go ahead and cut that out. I might leave myself just an eighth of an inch leeway here so it's not too snug. For me it's hard to get that just right. I like it snug but I don't want it um, too tight to actually sew on the sheath. And at a later date I'll figure out how much I want to um, let hang over for the flap. Pretty close right there. And then I'll go ahead and sew it up on the rawhide to give it a nice tight fit. But then what I actually do is 
after I sew it up on the rawhide, I will um, pull it out of the sheath to do the edging. All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, cut this back out. Scoot, just come to the outside of the, the hide, or outside of the line. I don't know if you can see this today or not. There we go. there so I can decide later how how much I want to use on that um, top. Make that nice. Get me some to play with there. I'm always worried about cutting off too much. But I usually if I do, I don't waste it. I can I can cut um, leather thongs with the material if I make a mistake. Or a small bag or something. Okay. All right. Now we'll actually take the back. I'm going to trim that up a little more before I start. And the front, and at this time I'm going to try to actually figure out what I need um, on this flat portion to fold down and go ahead and get those kind of cut out. Okay, as you can see, I went ahead and cut cut the uh, front portion of the sheath out, cut the back portion of the sheath out, and um, now before I sew it together, I want to do the, the little flap. Um, that's going to be the same as this black and white right here. Um, so, let me see. We will go ahead and... Um, Flatten a quill. Double check this picture. All right. Go ahead and choose a couple quills of the same width. Once again, same as that center section. Go ahead and cut off the two ends. And we'll flatten them. I just find it's easier to handle the piece if you go ahead and um, try to get all the quilling done um, before you sew it together. Um, okay, let's go ahead and uh, once again the back stitch method with two needles. We'll secure that down with a couple back stitches. Same on this side. We'll just quickly start this, and um, then the next step will be sewing the front to the back. Okay, let's go ahead and start two quills together. And once again, I think I want the um, white to be on the top. When you fold it, so it has to be on the bottom when you sew it down. back stitch go to the outside okay fold it over Back stitch to the outside with that needle. Let's 
starch out with the white. Okay. Switch needles. And stitch on the line another back, back stitch. Okay, I'll continue doing that. Until I get this piece done across. As you can see, it, it will be time to insert another, another white quill. I'll go ahead and um, I'll let you follow me until we actually do that. There we go. Now you can see at this point I'll have to add a white quill. And once again, if you can keep from adding the two at once, you have a nicer, flatter portion. So go ahead and um, I'll choose a white quill that I haven't had soaking in water, trim it, flatten it, once again we'll raise this side and we will continue on. Said, I'll continue on until I finish to this point and then we'll come back and um, I'll show how I um, sew the piece together. Okay, you can see I've finished um, the flat portion because it's much easier to do now than um, after it's been sewn together. And um, go ahead and take your material that you're going to use to um, Sew your sheath up. You want something good and sturdy, uh, either a, a heavy waxed linen or a split sinew, something like that. Okay, um, then I go ahead and put a knot in it. And I start at the bottom of the sheath. And I'll go up one side at a time. And um, we'll sew up this side. And then when I sew up the other side, I, um, I'll put the inner sheath in at that time. So let's go ahead and get it nice and matched. And... Um, Take nice, I do whip stitch, nice small stitches, fairly close together. And then we'll continue on with the whip stitch until I get up to this point here. And then I'll come to the other side and I'll stitch around to the top. Okay, I thought I'd better catch up with uh, letting you know what I've been doing. Um, I got it all sewed together, the back to the front, and um, of course this cool work was done before that. Um, after looking at it though, even though I have it sewn together, I'm gonna put another identical row above it to fill the space in a little more. Um, and then, um, I'm probably attached cones 50 different ways over the years, but I was looking at this and I thought, you know, so often they, they fall off and, um, on the, um, brain tan, uh, phones, they work the best rather than on, it seems like if I do them on linen or something, they pull right off. 
So I was looking at this and I thought I would um, just loop a, a thong through the back, leaving the front dangle down. And if I did them in an even amount of uh, cones, I could, uh, I could do that and I thought it would really strengthen that because um, when I do my, um, my edging, I'm going to try to go ahead and sew this down also on each side. So it won't be loose anyway. So um, before um, I finished the last cone, I thought I'd tell you. Like I said, each one, uh, each two cones is one thong. That was um, I took a heavy Glover's needle and I sewed it in one end, leaving the ends hang down, and then come out the other side. Um, I then cut a real narrow edge. And uh, slipped a little glass bead up and snugged that up on that. Um, I went ahead and um, put my cone on. This time I'm using brass cones. Uh, put a little knot in there. And then, just like in my other video, um, I get the little hank of deer hair. Um, take a thread. And we go ahead and uh, tie that real securely didn't really leave myself enough here tied that at least three or four times pulling it really tight And then, um, once you've done that, go ahead and uh, knot it about four times. One, two, three, four, and that should be. Let's see, I didn't get that piece in. That's going to be a pretty thin one. Let's go ahead and add in. I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more in there. That's probably pretty good. So you don't want it. You don't want it too fat, but you want them looking a little bit sparse. Let's just add a few more hairs. I can always pull hair out, but I. You certainly can't add it. Okay, let's try this again. Give me a little more to work with. Okay. Add one. Two. And you can make your own decision on um, if you want the hairs to uh, be long or if you'd like to cut them off short. I've had real short ones and then pretty long ones. Probably on, I'm thinking, might leave them kind of long on this. We'll see. This should be plenty, I would think. Okay, let's cut that long one off of there. And, um, as I've shown you before, you go ahead and run it up through here. Since this is um, a pretty thin piece of brain tan thong I'm running it up on, I'm only um, going to stitch it one time. And um, because I don't want it to uh, to break it, and I think one is all it's going to. I certainly don't want to weaken it. All right. Okay, here we go. That was one, two, 
I think five times going um through here. Five times. Snip it off. We can trim everything up later. And then kind of push that down. Oh, and then to make it really nice and secure, um, come down here and tie a knot just as close as you can. Anything to help them from falling off. It's probably not quite as high as I would like to have that, but okay. I'll go ahead and push that up with probably a needle or something, and um, there we go. Okay. We'll kind of pull those down and even those up, but as you can see, um, that should be a pretty secure way to do that, and I'll trim all everything up. Um, but um, the next step, I'm going to go ahead and finish this portion right here, and um, then we should be ready to start our edging and. Um, once we do that, just make our um, our our neck piece, and uh, I think that should be about it. All right. What we're getting ready to do now, um, I went ahead and um, put another strip of the of the double quill work um, to match on this side, and then did a little piece of roping around it to trim it. Then, um, just to give it a little more of a finished look, I went ahead and um, stitched both sides down. And now I'm going to start the um, trim. And um, I think I'm going to, since this one won't have cones at the bottom that I would no that I could normally do with a brain tan, and then and then end them at the bottom and hang cones on them. Um, the customer doesn't want cones, so. I think I'm going to, just to give a little finer of a look, I'm going to use a heavy linen thread and I'm going to start it right here on the corner. And um, we will start that in just a moment. Okay, it's time to start the um, quilled edging. You can see I've uh, done another row of double of double quills to match this side and then done a little bit of trim around that just to give it a nicer appearance and I have sewn down the um, little flap here to uh, so it wouldn't stand up. Chosen linen cord that I've waxed um, to do the edging on this time and um, I went ahead and sewed down my first quill sewed it securely underneath underneath the cord and then we'll start our um, edging by, let's see, we'll wrap it over. Let's go ahead and sew that down before we wrap it over. Okay. You want to come back about a eighth of an inch. Push it through to the back. All right. Now that'll hold it down. We'll go ahead and um, push it under and over. Back 
there we go pull that tight and once again about an eighth of an inch down Okay, hold that down, keep it taut, and we'll go ahead and, uh, there we go. Now you'll see we're starting to form our little, our little arrowheads, or whatever you want to call it, to um, make our little nice edging. Come down and do material enough to, um, so it doesn't disappear. There we go. Snug that up, keep it close. There we go. As you can see, this makes a much, much finer edging than the brain tan. I know I said that before, but if you want to, um, I have another video that shows a, a larger edging um, being done over the brain tan thong. And I'm sure it's just whatever you want for whatever piece you're doing. Okay, that's kind of a dry one, so let's go ahead and start another one, just because that one is such a dry piece. Yeah, there we go. We'll go ahead and insert your barbed in, lift that last stitch up and push it to the back. Put the barbed end in the back and go ahead and put your, hold it down with your fingers. Get that, um older quill to the back, the small one, hold it down. Oops. I don't think mine coordinated tonight. down. Let's snug that up a little bit. I'm going to continue on um, until we start the black and white, and um, that is going to be done with two quills. I'll just show you one more. You take the existing quill, go under the thread, or the cord rather, over the cord, and then when you go to sew it down, you'll come from the back, underneath the cord, underneath the quill, and then be sure you come down about an eighth of an inch to the back. Okay, I'll go ahead and finish this section and then we'll come back and do the double. Well friends, you can see we're finished with the knife sheath and due to technical difficulties, I was unable to um, show you how to do the um, the alternating colors black and white edging so we'll save that for another video it's it is pretty advanced um, anyway and also um, I did I twined the neck strap so again we'll just save those for other videos you can you don't have to have a twine neck strap you can just sew on any any piece of brain tan or something that you would prefer to have a nice neck strap 
I sew, always sew them on with heavy linen thread and uh, I use a glover's needle but um, but there is the finished product um, not perfect of course but don't get discouraged if yours isn't perfect um, most of the Native American pieces were not perfect so um, I want to thank you all for um, viewing my video and I hope you learned something along the way and you will tune in to um, see some future videos down the road. Thanks so much.